But I can tell you, having read the material on Amir, we're in for a real treat. Uh, it's going to be uh, a disturbing uh, occasion, in a sense, because we are going to be talking about violence and cruelty. But it's important <coughs> that, <coughs> that we uh, deal with Mardi Gras <coughs> not only as a celebration and a place and time of joy, but a as a reminder that we live in a world uh, in which there is terrible violence, great wrong, and that as human beings and moral persons, we have our obligations as far as we can to correct all that. And that that is the essence of what we're on about in Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras was not just about gay marriage. I can tell you, you can get by perfectly well for a very long time <laughs> without a marriage, a piece of paper from government telling you that you love somebody. But um, it's good that we got marriage in Australia. It's right as citizenship that we got it. Uh, but we're not here tonight to talk specifically about Australia. Now, um, Amir, you grew up a as a boy uh, in Iraq. Uh, did you grow up under the Saddam regime? Yeah. Uh, and I was told that during the Saddam regime, it was actually a better time for women, uh, for gays, uh, for people who like to have a drink uh, and other things. Uh, is that a correct estimate in your opinion about the Saddam regime or, or not? Yes, um, you know, I don't have first-hand experience because I was 13 when Saddam was overthrown. But through the documentation we've been doing, through my parents and families that we've known, uh, we LGBT plus people were not legally protected, but they still had a lot of underground uh, community, uh, LGBT plus friendly bars and restaurants, uh, cruising areas, uh, and just have, uh, being able to uh, safely uh, organize, which is no longer possible. It was basically a sort of don't ask, don't tell society. If you kept it to yourself, you could find spaces just as I did uh, 50 years ago in Sydney, Australia, and uh, that was how you were, left, you were left alone, basically, then. Exactly. I think the main thing with Saddam was, even though he was a big dictator and he's abused all kinds of human rights in his time, uh, I think the main thing with him was uh, if, if some groups are not against him, he's not going to really pay that much attention to them. And LGBT plus people were never really vocal about their rights uh, in Iraq, at least not publicly. So they were not a direct target of Saddam and his regime. Was he a Ba'athist? Was, uh, was his, his uh, political regime founded on the Ba'ath party, which was a secular uh, system of po politics, I think? A secular nationalist uh, and just promoting the Arabism uh, and as a collective, but he was not a religious uh, leader. No. A and when he was overthrown, um, you were of an age of consciousness, so you would have known what was going on. Were you in Baghdad or were you in another part of Iraq? Um, I was born and raised in Baghdad, but at that point we were in the north in, in one of the Kurdish cities because my mom is a Kurd. Um, and I remember uh, very clearly we were told to uh, cover the windows with uh, plastic bags because there was this idea that Saddam will have a final attack on Kurds with chemical weapons. Uh, it never happened, but I remember these aspects to things. But both of my parents tried to keep us away from TV channels and things to keep us away from watching what was happening, especially me and my younger sister. And um, the attacks on LGBT uh, population in Iraq happened pretty quickly after the overthrow of uh, Saddam. He was captured in 2003, I think. Yes. What is your recollection as a small, you were still a young boy at that time. What 
What is your recollection of that tremendous disruption that happened after the overthrow of the dictator? I think, you know, leaving a power vacuum after Saddam because there was no clear leaders, uh, I th what the powers that invaded Iraq didn't really plan for what's, what's after Saddam. So that left a big power vacuum in the country and the division, even though all the groups were divided on who would take power, one of the few things that they agreed on is that LGBT plus people and non-normative people in general do not have a place in Iraq. So the LGBT plus friendly bars and restaurants that were safer under Saddam were actually actively targeted and either bombed or burnt. Uh, a lot of arrests happening uh, and LGBT plus people being targeted and even being killed. And, and at that stage, uh, you were still very young. And when did you get to a position where you were exploring what the LGBT population had to offer to you. Yeah. Uh, I've had... <laughs> <laughs> if I can uh, put it that way. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've started having feelings and ideas of who I am very young. Uh, I think I was nine when I first realized that I had to crush on someone, uh, a guy, obviously. Uh, well, not obviously, but a guy. Uh, and I think since then, I never really had a phase where I was rejecting my identity, but I had a few years of being confused and not knowing what it means. Uh, I think I come from a family that even though they were not at that point pro-LGBT plus people, uh, my mother always taught us to stand for who we are, uh, regardless of what that was. Was that because uh, of her Kurdish background or, or not? I think it was because of her family, uh, not necessarily because of her ethnic background. Tell me something about uh, her family. Very educated. I think her father, for example, every time she graduated from a class to the next, her her gift would be traveling and exploring the world and learning more about what's happening in the world. And just herself, she's a very strong woman. And, uh, you know, she's uh, in a Muslim country in the 70s and the uh, 60s, 70s and 80s, growing up, going to college, wearing mini skirts, not being covered, smoking, even though her dad didn't like that. And just for me, she's the OG feminist, the original feminist. Uh, I was raised by one, so it was impossible for me not to be someone who would stand up for who he is in the first place. And she, uh, I think you told me before, was a person with a long lineage, uh, which uh, was an important thing in a Muslim respect. What was that? Yes, uh, so my mom is the 27th grandchild of the Prophet, the Muslim Prophet, and they have a certified tree that tracks it all the way back, so on paper she should not be okay with who I am, or that's a perception around the world that Muslims will not be okay with LGBT plus people. Well, it certainly is true that many of the stories you recount uh, in the uh, uh, Iraq queer uh, reports are of uh, the rejection of children by parents, and that seems to be more common than acceptance. Absolutely. I think it's actually a really sad reality. Uh, in the last 10 years of me working with LGBT plus rights, I've interviewed so many LGBT plus uh, people who were rejected by their families, who were actually haunted by their families uh, and wanting them to be killed. So I think for me to have that reality in my work and then to have a completely different reality with my own parents, with my mom especially, because my father passed away a few years ago. It was something that I was both shocked to have that, but at the same time, very grateful. In terms of um, Islam, is it possible to talk about uh, the situation that you are going to describe in Iraq without at least a brief reflection on Islam and homosexuality? I think in today's Iraq it's not possible uh, because it's a very, uh, Islam and religion in general is very embedded in the politics we have. So 
even though legally it's not illegal for LGBT plus people to exist, uh, it's not legal either. So in that case, they rely on uh, religion, which is, I think, one of the first articles of the Constitution say that religion is the main source of our laws. Uh, so it's not possible for us to talk about the legal situation of LGBT plus people without talking about religion. And after the fall of, uh, of Saddam, did they introduce a criminal code provision that uh, prohibited uh, homosexual activity? It was actually the opposite. Uh, they removed the code that prohibited being LGBT+. But that being said, that was, it could be viewed as a progressive step. But in reality, in the rare occasions where politicians made any statement about LGBT plus people, it's actually that they don't even recognize that we exist. So how would you put a law for a group that doesn't exist? So we're so invisible that even the law doesn't recognize the simple fact that we exist. Well, of course, in the common law, as you might know, uh, the provision was often expressed in statutes as the crime that uh, cannot be mentioned, uh, the, the offence that is too abominable to even be mentioned and described. So that's not all that uncommon in the religions of the book. Yeah. But a feature of Islam um, seems to be its great particularity and specificity uh, in uh, the hadith concerning the way in which people who are caught committing homosexual crimes uh, are to be put to death. They are to be thrown off bin uh, a tower, a building. Uh, and so um, I was really not all that surprised to see in material that uh, you have produced to the United Nations uh, images of young people, apparently young people, uh, being killed by being thrown off a tower or off a building. Yeah, yeah uh, that was, you know, especially happened under the Islamic State uh, in Mosul and the surrounding areas. Uh, and that was, you know, something that was not new uh, to the LGBT plus community because the international community paid more attention to these crimes. But in reality, LGBT plus people have been killed in one way or another before ISIS and they continue to be killed after ISIS. But it does seem from reading the materials that you presented to the United Nations uh, through the work of uh, Iraq queer that um, it, was, it was much worse in the Islamic State. It was more public. I, wouldn't, I think it's as bad under the Iraqi government. And in fact, one of the militias or armed groups that is an official partner of the Iraqi government under the name of Fighting ISIS uh, is one of the oldest that has carried out a lot of killing campaigns against LGBT plus people, organized where they uh, publish a list of names of people who are suspected to be LGBT plus, especially feminine men, whether they're gay or not, uh, and being killed. And that's been happening at least once a year since 2006. And yet, <coughs> in one of your statements, uh, you've indicated that uh, a religious leader in Iraq, who would be known to us as one of those um, uh, who spoke out very strongly after the fall of Saddam, um, did caution against the violence towards LGBT people. Uh, it was Muqtad al-Sadr who actually won the last elections uh, in Iraq. He's not in power, even though his party won the elections. He didn't get enough votes to form a government. Uh, but I think the thing with him is, before that statement, he was actually the main driver of the violence against LGBT plus people. Uh, and then I think when he started organizing for a political campaign, he wanted to be politically correct for the international community. That's why he made that statement. And he said, LGBT plus people are rejected. They need our help. Uh, they are problematic, but we can't kill them. So he's still not you know, pro-LGBT plus people, uh, but he's at least saying no more killing. I once went uh, about five years ago to Iran and gave a talk and in it referred to LGBT rights and issues. But uh, in Iraq, there is no, uh, your understanding, there is no 
uh, engagement with the issue of LGBT rights. It, it's simply an invisible uh, issue which uh, the opponents wish to keep invisible. Well, by religious leaders, it's not an invisible issue. They're actually the drivers, many of them are the drivers of many of the killing campaigns against us. Uh, but by the government, there were very rare uh, occasions where they make any kind of statement. But the last statement that was made a couple of weeks ago, actually, was a big win for us because the deputy prime minister of the Kurdish region tweeted uh, that LGBT plus people should be protected and should be equal citizens. And that was the first time in Iraq's history that we have a politician making that statement. And it was the result of working for two years with his wife because she works with human rights to at least make a statement about the importance of equality. Uh, aside from that, every single statement that was made about LGBT plus people was uh, a rejecting statement, offensive, and not recognizing us as citizens. And often the, the, um, the idea is put forward that um, gay people, um, if, if women, lesbians, uh, only need um, to be corrected by uh, rape, uh, and that um, other LGBT people are the product of um, unsatisfactory sexual lives. Is that, is that really what goes on in the minds of the opponents of LGBT people in Iraq? Yeah, we, we're doing a media study this year and uh, we're analyzing some of the uh, programs that are talking about LGBT plus people on Iraqi TV. And they usually host a religious leader a therapist and then a community leader. And that community leader changes. <laughs> uh, and so far we've discovered that 92% of the words they use to refer to LGBT plus people are some of the words you've just mentioned, that they're sick, that they are mentally um, you know, ill, they need therapy, uh, they are, they've Beautiful. been raped, exactly. They've been raped when they were children, they don't have a, a good relationship with their uh, parents, uh, all kinds of misconceptions that are being uh, discussed. And I think what makes that really dangerous in a country like Iraq is where I think 90% of the population in Iraq gets their information from TV channels. How many of them will actually go and research after they receive that information? So they're left they go away with that information. And that's the thing that they keep discussing among themselves. But there's also, let us be frank, the problem of sheer brutal fear and violence, which comes out tremendously powerfully in the uh, Iraq queer uh, publications and submissions to the United Nations. Tell us a little bit about the, the brutality and uh, dangerous uh, predicament that an LGBT person f faces in Iraq. Yeah, uh, I think it's important to differentiate between the violence committed by the uh, religious groups, the government, and government-affiliated groups, which is, I think, more than 60% of the violence. So our government is actually the main human rights violator against us. <coughs> Uh, and then there are families associated with these groups who kill their children to protect their honor. Uh, every year, like I said, there is, since 2006, there has been at least one killing campaign targeting LGBT plus people. Uh, in 2017 alone, there were more than 220 killings of LGBT plus people. Until now, not even one person has been held accountable for any kind of violation, let alone the killing of LGBT plus people. Uh, even through our publications and the report we sent to the UN, uh, we continue a asking and demanding for accountability for you know, the basic right to life because the right to life is the most basic right. Without the right to life, we can't talk about any other right. So if the government of Iraq is not even recognizing the basic, our basic right to life, that's a huge problem. 
and that's the thing that we want to keep pushing for. It we can add to the fact that the media, far from being uh, supportive or at Absolutely. least neutral or open to putting forward different points of view, have been a major source of the violence and whipping up uh, public animosity against LGBT people. Absolutely. And even a year ago, they actually had a specific report on Iraq. We were saying that we're funded by uh, the, uh, the Clintons and the CIA. <laughs> Uh, and all kinds of conspiracy theories and all these things. But I think what really made us visible internationally is uh, the kind of work we do, the, some of the information we have, or a lot of the information we have has never been produced before. We work in very strategic partnerships with local and international organizations who give us a different kind of legitimacy. Uh, our international organizations give us access to uh, international mechanisms, including the UN, uh, and just having interacting directly with uh, embassies in Baghdad from different states that are supportive of LGBT plus people, and showing them that we're very, you know, we're try to be as credible as we can be and uh, as smart about using the resources we have. So, after producing all kinds of work for a few years, I think they see that there is value in the work we do and we're the only organization that submits LGBT plus focused shadow reports to the United Nations from Iraq. So I think we need more people to step out of their comfort zone, to recognize that when you talk about human rights, you can't be selective, otherwise you're talking about human privileges. If your rights only extend to a certain group of people, that's not equality, that's not human rights. You either have an intersectional approach and recognize that human rights, whether LGBT plus people, women, or any other groups, we're not talking about different rights. They're the exact same things. In terms of what Australians can actually do, where does the funding for uh, Iraq queer come from and what can we do in Australia apart from listen to you and marvel at your courage and determination uh, and on how articulate you are uh, we what what can we do to be of support uh, you know I'm sure all of us know we live in very special times in the world uh, I think the first thing you can do here is to keep pushing for better refugee policies and laws because the violence we face in Iraq, LGBT plus people face, is not a temporary kind of violence. It will need a few years of social change and ena enabling the government to protect the citizens equally. So to be able to have, even though Australia is really far from Iraq, it's still one of the, it's not many countries that has the legal system in Australia uh, that is protective of LGBT plus people. But also on the international community, you know, the U.S. withdrew from the Human Rights Council, which means we need more states like Australia, like other progressive countries that believe in human rights, that believe in LGBT plus rights, to be doubly and triple vocal uh, about these rights because whether we like it or not, the U.S. is a huge power in the world and has a huge influence. And just not having that influence in the Human Rights Council means the other states need to pick up the slack, basically. Uh, it's not enough for them to say we're doing our part. You need to do more. And that's just a part of being a part of the international community. Well, I think uh, you'll agree that this uh, graduate from Columbia University, uh, who is so articulate and strong and courageous in the face of all sorts of pressures that we can even only partly imagine, uh, is um, a wonderful herald for uh, his people. And they don't know that yet, but uh, it's very important that we uh, give support. And I think we should think um, in the remaining time of what we can do to be of support for Iraq queer, because you just, the issue of gay marriage in Australia in the South Seas is not the only issue on the LGBTIQ agenda.